So having looked at the direct stiffness in one dimension, we now need to work out how we can transform to two and possibly three dimensions so that we can actually do something practical with this method. So we now have a bar with nodes one and two of length L, but it's now at an arbitrary angle alpha to the X coordinate. Okay, so as a result of this rotation alpha from just being in the in the X, directly aligned with the X axis now, we, we now have instead of, and we're gonna look at node two first, Instead of just a force F2 and also a displacement U2 at node 2, we now have two components of the forces there. We, so we have an F2X and an F2Y. And we can relay F2 to F2Y and F2X using the angle alpha. First, before we do that, we can also use the geometry if we know the coordinates of node one and node two, we can use those coordinates to calculate the sines and cosines of the angle alpha. Say if we didn't actually know alpha, but all we know is the coordinates, which is usually the situation. So we can say, so let's give our nodes some coordinates. Let's call this x2 and y2 the coordinates of node two. And the coordinates of node 1 then will be x1 and y1. And using that bit of information, we know that the length of the bar is L. So we can work out that this distance here is y2 minus y1. Similarly, for the x-axis, we know that the distance here would be x2 minus x1. And we can just use Sokotoa to help us find the signs. So the sine of the angle, I'm just call it S. So it equals sine of alpha is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by the length L. Similarly, the cosine, so cos of alpha is equal to x2 minus x1 divided by the length of the bar L. And we're going to use these relationships now. We haven't even bothered to calculate alpha. We'd rarely ever need to, to have that angle calculated. What we can now do is transform our original forces that act along the bar f1 and f2 now into the two components at each node f1x and f1y f2x and f2y using the sines and cosines so we could be writing then for instance that f1x equals f1 times cos of alpha and we know that the cos of alpha is the x2 minus x1 over l that we can calculate and we can do similar for f1y equals f1 sine of alpha and i'm going to write these two relationships that i've just written down as well as the relationships for f2x and f2y I'm going to write these down in matrix format so we can say that F1x equals cos of alpha, cos of alpha multiplied by F1. And similarly, F1y was sine of, al sine of alpha multiplied by F1. And if we do that for the force F2 as well, F2x equals cos of alpha multiplied by F2 and F2y equals sine of alpha multiplied by F2. And we can write, and we write that in a neat set of matrix equations. And we're gonna call the matrix containing the causes and signs. 
We're going to call that the transformation matrix, and we're just going to give that for now the letter G. And uh, for consistency with other notes that you'll see in textbooks, we're going to call the format that we've got at the moment the transformation matrix transposed. So transformation matrix G transposed multiplied by F1 and F2 is equal to the four components F1X, F1Y, F2X and F2Y. Now this transformation matrix G also applies not only to the forces but can also apply to the displacements. And we've written it down here on the left hand side that the four components in two dimensions of the displacement are equal to the transformation matrix transposed multiplied by the two displacements u1 and u2 that are in line with the axes of the beam. One of the great things about this transformation matrix is we can also complete the inverse transformation. So if we know the four components we can always get back to the components in line with the axis of the beam and to do that we multiply using just the transformation matrix G not transposed in this case multiply by U1X, U1Y, U2X and U2Y. Okay so how is this going to help us out? What we're going to do is go back to our original set of equations for the stiffness of a bar in one dimension. So if we remember the two forces F1 and F2 were equal to Ea divided by L multiplied by 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 multiplied by the two displacements along the axis of the bar U1 and U2. Now we need to get this equation that is applicable just in one dimension we want to transform this so that we can use it in two-dimensional situations. So in order to do so, what I'm going to do first is transform the left-hand side of the equations from the two forces in line with the axis of the bar into the four components. And to do that, to get the four components, I can pre-multiply this left hand side of the equation F1 and F2 by the transformation matrix G transposed. But if I pre-multiply F1 and F2 by G transposed, I'm also going to have to pre-multiply the right hand side of the equation by G transposed as well. So to save me and you guys with my terrible handwriting, the G transposed, I'm going to write that down and I've got these in the type notes. So F1X, F1Y, F2X, F2Y equals G transpose multiplied by F1 and F2, which now means our left, our right hand side it also needs to be multiplied. So we now have G transpose EA divided by L, 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. But now the right hand side is still in terms of the two displacements u1 and u2 along the axes of the of the bar so we now need to be able to transport we now need to make get rid of these u1 and u2 and have this in terms of the four individual components and so scrolling back up slightly we can see that we can use this formula here to convert our u1 and u2 into g times u1x, u1y, u2x and u1y. So what I need to do is substitute this into here to get rid of the components just along the bar to have the four components of displacement. And so here is the equation, I've written it down. And substituted into this equation above becomes this. So now we have on the left hand side four components of the force, four components of the displacement. We have the original one dimensional stiffness matrix. 
but to convert it into two dimensions we have to multiply by the transformation matrix transposed and post multiply by the transformation matrix and so the resulting set of equations still has the same format but f equals k times u as we had in one dimension and therefore the whole of this expression here is what we're going to call our stiffness matrix in two dimensions now that we have our stiffness matrix in two dimensions one problem that we could conceive is but our bar here we have a bar with one and two and one is at the left hand side two is at the right hand side what if we had an arbitrary bar in the middle of a massive tr truss structure and the left hand side was joint number 27 and the right hand side was joint 12. so does our numbering of our nodes give us problems further down the line or do we have to have some crafty way of numbering the nodes such that alpha is always a positive angle and it turns out no we don't but we need to prove to ourselves that that isn't the case so what we're going to examine is the stiffness matrix in two dimensions all by itself and just remind ourselves that that was the stiffness coefficient multiplied by the transpose of the transformation matrix then we have the coefficient matrix one minus one minus one one that we had in one dimension and then post multiplied by the transformation matrix so if we multiply out now just writing the equation above in the longer form we're using the c's for cos s for sine multiplying out this matrix so first of all we're going to multiply these two terms together and we get multiplying out we get c minus c s minus s multiplied now by the by g and so we're going to have to now follow this multiplication operation and you're doing that multiplication operation we have e a over l on the outside and lots of terms in terms of causes or signs now just inspecting this for a second we can see that most a lot of the terms we have cos squared terms or we have sine squared terms so if you multiply the numbers if the coses or sines were to change sign but when you square the term you're always going to get a positive number we also have situations where we have so let's have a look at this one here we have a cos and a sine so the cos and the sine might be of different signs so that could be a negative number and it could be then if we choose our angle differently that the cos or the sines might flip sign let's have a look at that for a second how that be so at node one using the original angle measured positive counterclockwise from the x-axis but we we have this angle alpha if we were to renumber the bar such that we have node one now at the top and node two at the bottom but we still measured from node one to node two our angle anti-clockwise positive from the x-axis and we're going to call that angle beta and that angle now beta is the original angle alpha plus pi radians so beta equals alpha plus pi cos beta now is equal to minus one times cos alpha sine beta is minus one times sine of alpha therefore going back our transpose matrix will be now minus the original transpose matrix if we were using the original node numbering so that conceivably would cause us a problem until we go back and have a look 
at these multipliers. So we already mentioned any cos squared terms will always give you a positive number. But if, so going back to this one, we originally had a positive cos but a negative sign. Changing the node numbering now will give us a negative cos but a positive sign. So this coefficient will not change its sign when we multiply out. So the node numbering doesn't matter. However, one big health warning. Not measuring the angle in a consistent manner anti-clockwise from the x-axis will affect the behavior.